Majora's Mask, Chapter 15, The Palace Cave. sneak past these two? Tattle asked. Link wasn't sure. He knelt on a patch of soft soil with Tattle just beside him, peering around an imposing fortress wall. He watched two Deku scrub guards, spears in hand, stand before a row of Deku flower buds. Each was at attention, their eyes intent on his hiding place. Ah, oh, as if they're used to people sneaking around here, Link thought. Do people actually try stealing from this place? I'm not sure if we can. Link squeaked in his Deku voice. They'd already progressed through the first garden only to find another one. Rows of flower buds were surrounded by fortress barricades that scraped the sky. <sighs> It'd help if it wasn't the middle of the day, Tattle said, looking up at the fierce sun uninhibited by clouds. Well, we don't have enough time to wait for night. Link said. Maybe we should go back. There might be a path to the bean cellar from the other garden. Or how about you wait here while I go do some distracting? What? Link said. W what do you mean by distracting? Flight, Deku Head. I'll use the power of flight for the greater good while you run. Since, you know, you're stuck on the ground... Sound good? Ah, uh, sure, Tattle, Link said, rolling his eyes. I'll make sure to open any doors we come across in return. Tattle scoffed, for once left speechless as she flew around their hiding spot. Link scooted as close to the edge as he dared, bracing himself to run. Um, excuse me, Tattle said to the two guards. They immediately spotted her. Tattle danced over the young Deku flowers, feigning an absent-minded, carefree flight path. Um, do either of you know where the nearest fairy fountain is? I'm parched, and don't feel like going all the way to Clock Town. Oh, you have no business here, fairy, one of the guards said, slamming his spear down dramatically. Leave immediately! Both guards turned back to the wall, hiding Link. Link tensed for only a moment before he realized he was still hidden. Please! Tattle said, fluttering her wings innocently. You wouldn't turn away a little fairy girl, would you? Rear, rear, rear. I have no time for this, the guard said. Go away! But I need your guidance, oh wise guard of the Deku Palace! She flew right in front of his face, but the scrub pretended not to notice, adamantly looking at Link's hiding place. Hmm, if you must know, he said, sighing, but still refusing to look. There's a fountain near the Woodfall Temple, but the fairy there was attacked and can't help you. I go to Clock Town. I haven't heard anything bad about that one. Why, thank you, kind sir, Tattle exclaimed flying behind them. She stopped when she reached the row of Deku flowers. Oh my, what are these? The guard didn't grace her with an answer, and Tattle responded by pulling the weak roots of a bud loose. She tossed the plant aside, moving to the next flower and destroying it as well. The guard tried his best to ignore her until he realized the sound of tearing roots. He spun around, eyes filled with panic. Hey, step away from those! the Deku scrub said, gesturing the other guard to follow him. Oh, I don't step, I fly. <laughs> Tattle continued uprooting baby Deku flowers, singing to herself as she wrecked mayhem on the garden. <laughs> One guard swung his spear as soon as he was in range, but Tattle dodged it. Irritation was etched into his wooden face as the fairy blithely continued ripping out more flowers. The pile of dead plants only grew at her feet. The next time the guard thrust his spear, irritation had replaced with fury. 
His strike narrowly missed Tattle, but the guard did not yield as he slashed his weapon in all directions. The second guard joined in, trailing after the fairy that led them as far from Link as possible. Link smiled. <laughs> I can always count on her to be distracting. He wasted no time running from his hiding spot and searching for the next. He found a doorway on the far fortress wall. The small room had a dirt floor instead of grass, and it blocked out all sunlight. Random plant matter and broken spears lay scattered about. Another doorway sat across the room, leading to more gardens. Link waited in the room's cover for Tattle, and it wasn't all that long before she found him. <sighs> Jeez, Tattle said, trying to catch her breath. They're just a bunch of Deku flowers. Oh, you did great. It's entertaining to watch you bother someone other than me. Glad I could help. Now, come on, let's get back to sneaking. I'm not sure how much more distracting I have in me. Link nodded, walking to peek around the next doorway. The new garden had two more guards, though they faced the opposite direction this time. The far wall, however, wasn't a wooden fortress barrier. It was a rock face, obviously marking the end of the palace. At its base, where rock met grass, he saw a cave. The dark passage concealed whatever lay beyond. Yeah, that has to be it, Link said. Looks good enough to me. Should we sneak past these bozos before they turn around? Behind them, the two guards from earlier leveled their spears. The leader showed nothing but contempt in his narrow eyes. Ah, Tattle stammered. Oh, we were just leaving to go to that fairy fountain you mentioned. Well, you're under arrest. Uh, yeah, I figured. Link, time to run. Link spun on his feet, fleeing for the cave, and the fairy followed. Link could hear the guard's footsteps, which sounded faster than his own. Uh, would it ruin everything if I took my mask off now? His human feet were quicker, but he didn't trust himself to take it off smoothly mid-pursuit. Stop him! The front guard shouted, raising his spear to impale the intruders. In the next garden, the other authorities were quick to notice the commotion. They joined in and immediately outnumbered them. <sighs> The two sets of guards threatened to intersect him before he reached the cave. Link leaned forward, running as fast as his small legs would allow. Their spears reared back to strike, but Link leapt for the cave's mouth before they could. He disappeared into the dark with his fairy, and all four guards slammed into one another, sending one lethal weapon to crunch through another scrub's leg. Disarmed and injured, they lay sprawled at the cave's entrance. Link rolled onto the rocky, moist floor, breaking his momentum, but not escaping a few bumps. He struggled to his feet as Tattle joined him. <sighs> you okay? Um, I think so. He said, steadying himself. They heard shouting outside. Link and Tattle found the garden brightly lit from here. The four Deku scrubs were already almost standing, ready to continue the chase. All right, no time to recuperate. Where do we go now? Link looked around for an answer to Tattle's question. The cave appeared to have already ended, hardly branching out a few feet. <sighs> um, maybe this was the wrong one. Link ran his hand along the wall and spotted an opening. Uh, uh, over there! Uh, right away! Tattle obeyed, revealing a slim crevice that exposed the cave's hidden path. Link followed her light, just as the guards caught him slipping into the hole. That way! They shouted. Link and Tattle ran through the narrow, curving passageway, which gradually sloped downward. Link's Deku feet disagreed with the jagged, slick floor, finding far too many cuts and slips. He stumbled once, but on the second time, he fell on his face. <sighs> Come on, Link! Tattle exclaimed, stopping as he got up. Did you forget? Link said, ignoring his sore feet. Uh, I don't have any boots on. This cave floor hurts. <sighs> then take off your mask, Tattle said. You're too far behind to see. 
Link followed her advice, though he kept jogging as he fumbled for the mask's edges. He heard the guard's metallic armor close behind him, but he decided to risk being seen. In only a moment, his human feet returned, once again encased in comfortable boots. The soreness lingered from his scrub form, but the boots soothed the would-be bruises. The burn marks on his right hand and legs from his octo battle returned, but the pain was faint. Uh, not sure if I'm any faster this way, Link thought. While his body was stronger and more agile, his shield, sword, and bag had returned, the latter of which now carried a bulky camera. Ugh, all that weight adds up! Link stowed his mask away regardless as they rounded another corner. Their journey through the cave grew darker and deeper, curving underneath the garden. The guards couldn't keep up. Eventually, the blonde teen slowed down as his fairy did, free from the chase's thrill. At that point, the cave took a sharp turn upwards. Uh, the surface must be close, he thought. Link climbed the steep slope as Tattle lit the way, rounding several stalagmites as he did. So, I guess that monkey actually knew what he was talking about, Tattle said, spotting a light at the end. <sighs> this probably takes us to the other side of the palace and back into the forest. Are you sure? Link asked. He didn't fancy returning to the woods of mystery again. He remembered Koma's warning about the strange things people saw near Terminus borders. I'm not ready to see Zelda again, he thought. I don't know where else it could lead. That's all there is in the south. Swamp and forest. I'm more of an ocean type myself. The west is where I can't wait to go. Maybe we'll go there next, Link said. As the light drew nearer, he dared to speak aloud another thought. You don't think this will take us out of Termina, do you? I hope not, Tattle exclaimed. What did Koma say it was out there? Darkness? That doesn't look like darkness to me. It can't all be darkness, Link said. Hyrule's got to be out there eventually. Yeah, eventually, Tattle said, forcefully ending the conversation. Several steps later, blinding sunlight replaced the dank cave. Their eyes adjusted to reveal long grass. It was a clearing. In a few feet, the trees started again, marking the forest's boundary. Behind Link and Tattle was the rock wall, continuing out of sight back the way they came. Someone else was there, sitting on a red gold blanket only a few feet away. The man rested at the clearing's edge. He was older than Link, but still seemed young for an adult, legs crossed beside a brown sack. He wore only pants, boasting a large, pale stomach that hung over his waistline. He merely sat there, continuously reaching into the bag at his side and eating from it. He said nothing, failing to even acknowledge the boy and fairy who emerged from the cave. Um, uh, hi, Blink eventually said, stopping at a safe distance. Whoa, the man said, continuing to shovel away food as he talked. You're the first customer I've had in a long time. The initial silence was broken only by the sound of crunchy snacks. I wouldn't doubt it, Tattle said. Your shop is in a remote corner of the swamp outside of a cave. Oh, but I'm not always here he said, as if that explained everything. The chewing made it difficult for Link to focus on his words. Can't he stop eating to have a conversation? I travel. I've only been here for a few days, which is longer than usually. It's just so pretty. The monkeys were nice company too, but the moon is kind of scaring me. I'll probably leave Termina tonight. Uh-huh, Tattle said. Nothing like vacationing in a swamp so you can talk to monkeys. Wait, are you from outside of Termina? Link said. Sure, the man said, shifting. I've hardly been here a week. What's it like? 
Link asked, blue eyes wide with interest. Across the border! He wasn't so enraptured, however, to miss Tattle's uneasy look. She still doesn't like talking about this, he thought. Oh, it's beautiful! It's B-E-A-utiful! The man exclaimed, finally putting down his snacks. He looked up and visualized with his hands. A magnificent field of flowers as far as the eye can see. So, so beautiful. It's one of the things I live for, sights like that. It's the main reason I travel as much as I do. So gorgeous. That's where the forest ends? Link asked skeptically. A field of flowers. The pale man nodded. Did you hear that, Tattle? It's not darkness, it's flowers. I don't know, Tattle said, obviously doubtful. With our luck, it's probably a field of killer flowers that suck your brains out. Link looked at her, dumbfounded. They're not killer flowers, the pale man said peacefully. They definitely are pretty. But they didn't take my brain. That's up for debate, monkey boy, Tattle said. And I don't want you to get your hopes up, Link. Like Comis said, strange things happen in those areas. May have appeared that way to him, but I'm not sure we'd find the same thing. What do you even mean by that? Link asked, but the fairy didn't answer. There's only one way to see what's really out there. No, no, Link, we're not going into the forest again, Tattle said. There's no reason to be afraid. We've been through this forest before. <sighs> yes, we have, and your girlfriend caused you to set the forest on fire. Besides, we're saving the monkey and the princess, remember? I thought you wanted to play the Song of Time and leave, Link reminded her. Well, that was before you convinced me otherwise. But you're not convincing me to change plans again. You said we should put the rest of our day to use. Risking our lives trying to leave Termina doesn't sound like using our time wisely. The four are in Termina, remember? Link didn't have a response, looking eagerly back to the forest. There was a moment of silence in which the pale man started eating again. So, he began. Do you need any magic beans? They sprout leaves as soon as you water them. Link tried to focus on the pale man, hardly able to withhold his frustration at Tattle. Why can't she just agree to go through the forest? That they do. They do. The man said mysteriously, ignoring the tension between the fairy and boy. That's actually why we came here, Tattle said, clearly ignoring it as well. So I guess I shouldn't critique your choice of locale. Clearly you still attract customers. How many can we have? How many can you pay for? The salesman asked. They're ten rupees apiece. Pay for? Adel said, taken aback. She looked over at Link, who walked to stand behind her. I, I don't have any money, Link whispered to Tattle. Listen, bub, I'm not paying a green rupee for those beans of yours, the fairy said. The outburst surprised both Link and the pale man. The latter put down his snacks and looked up at her, wide-eyed. We almost got ourselves killed by Tiku Scrubs coming out here to find you. The monkey didn't say anything about paying for them, and we need them to save his brother. So either you hand over the beans, or you can meet my friend here. He torched half the forest yesterday by shooting fire out of his hands, slayed a whole pack of wolfos with his sword, and can turn into a Tiku Scrub that shoots poison. So... What do you have to say to that? Do you feel lucky, punk? The salesman turned his astonished expression to Link, who merely stood there, dumbfounded. Did I mention I give all of my customers one free sample? He pulled another item from his bag, but instead of eating it, he held it out on his open palm. Small, multicolored bean pod rested there. Why, thank you, Tattle said, allowing Link to step forward and take it. 
Try planting it in some soft soil, the salesman advised. You can always buy more. Tattle glared at him again, which wiped the man's smile away. Uh, you can plant them whenever you want, but, but if you don't water them, their leaves won't grow. Wait, what? Tattle asked. You don't happen to have any bottled water, do you? She flew greedily to his other bags. Um, well, uh, Bean Seller said nervously. I'm not going to take that too, Link said, stepping past Tattle. He directed his attention to the man. Uh, sorry about her. She can be a little intense. I never would have attacked you. Hey! Tattle exclaimed. That's all right, the pale man said, returning to his snack. You aren't really going to torch, slay, or poison me. Uh, probably not, Link said. As he slipped the bean pod into his bag, he pulled out something else. But I will ask you to trade a bottle of water for this pictograph box. You could take a picture and savor any of your favorite sights. For later, whenever you find yourself in a dingy place like this again. He held it out, and the salesman examined it closely. It'll make up for almost stealing the beans, too. Huh? Well, all right. You've got a deal. Here, I'll even throw in two more beans. He pulled out the promised merchandise and offered it. The bottle was identical to the one he'd trapped Tattle in. Thank you very much, Link said, slipping the spare beans into his bag and holding onto the water. And good luck on your travels. And you as well, the bean salesman said, turning the pictograph box around in his hands. See, Link said, walking away. Not only did I get rid of Koma's clunky box, but I also got water and more beans. You don't have to violently manipulate everyone, Tattle. Pfft. Yeah, whatever floats your boat, Tattle said under her breath. I'm sticking to sarcasm and manipulation. She stopped flying when Link went back to the cave. Wait, what are you doing? Going back to the palace? Through the cave that the guards chased us through? Tattle asked. They're probably guarding the other end, expecting us to do that. How else are we going to get in? Link asked. The front door is not exactly an option anymore. Don't you remember what the monkey said? The secret entrance where we need the beans is outside of the palace. We won't be entering through any more doors. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. Link turned away from the cave. Should we keep following this rock wall until we reach the palace? Sounds good to me, oh great and saintly hero. Tattle led the way, appearing happy that Termina's border was no longer a conversation topic. But I'm still thinking about it. Link knew, and he wouldn't stop until he had answers. Shikashi adjusted the telescope's eyepiece ever so slightly. The moon's glowing orange eyes stared back from the other end. They watched the clock tower, as if determined beyond anything to reach it. The astronomer licked his lips nervously. Mm -hmm. Maybe all those paranoid people are right, he thought. The sun marked afternoon, and the old man feared he might not see it rise again. He stepped down from the massive telescope, turning to the two moon's tears behind him on pedestals. He'd found the second one last night. Hmm. That oversized moon produces them in abundance. His lengthy blue robe swished around his ankles as he walked to one. He hunched over to see through the tear's protective glass casing, his mystical blue eyes shining. Now on the edge of the platform, he made sure to keep his balance. He was old, so falling meant something different than it used to. The blue dome-shaped ceiling arced high above him. He stopped when he heard a doorknob clicking. The front door. The old astronomer turned around slowly. Now, who could that possibly be?
His visitor had already entered, however, and was closing the door behind him. Shikashi recognized the mischievous child. Oh, oh, the one from four days ago. The old man immediately turned around from the mask, shaking his head as he mumbled under his breath. No, no, no. Is this how you treat visitors? The masked child asked, floating off the floor. You're not a visitor, Shikashi said. He stepped off the platform and shuffled to the dresser against the wall. He picked up the many instruments lying on top and opened its drawers, shoving everything inside. Just put your things away, and he can't break them. Oh, you're here to break my instruments. I won't break your instruments if you tell me what I want to know, he said. His voice was neither childlike nor threatening. There is no more time for games. The Skull Kid traveled a few more feet until he hovered over the platform, coming to rest on its surface to tower above the old man. I don't believe you, Kashi said, shaking his head again as he stowed his belongings. You and the rest of your little gang of kids can't be trusted. Gang of kids? The Skull Kid asked. I'm not a child. And I'm not a fool, Shikashi said. Get out! You aren't welcome here. The astronomer stopped, lying his protractor back down, just as he turned to finally face the intruder. Please, don't do that, Shikashi said. It's my life. I am an astronomer. I have nothing else to live for. <sighs> then tell me where the fairy boy went, the Skull Kid demanded. I know he passed through here. He used your telescope to watch me on top of the clock tower. A fairy boy, Shikashi said, looking around as he tried to remember. I'm afraid I don't know who you're talking about. I haven't let anyone use my telescope. I don't believe you! The Skull Kid snapped. You know, don't you, all about their little plan. Where did they go, and what are they doing to try and stop me? I'm sorry, Shikashi said, turning back to his drawer of possessions. Don't look at him. Don't look at him, and he'll go away. I don't understand. I know not of a fairy or a boy. You must have noticed them walking by at the least, the Skull Kid said. I saw them leave through the southern gate. Where did they go after that? I don't... The old man stammered, but suddenly the dresser burst into purple flames. Shikashi let out an old, tired scream as he stumbled away, burned free. The astronomer cowered from the fire, hunched in submission before the sorcerer who stood atop the platform. I'm not leaving until you answer my question, the Skull Kid said, his unmoving wooden face menacing. Have you noticed anything happening, anything out of the ordinary? Shikashi shivered his mind numb with terror as he tried to find an answer. The, the moon? Anything else? No, the old man said. Nothing has happened here. I live in my observatory out by the woods. It's peaceful and quiet. Nothing ever happens, please. Don't hurt me. Nothing in the forest or around it, the Skull Kid persisted. They go into the forest, Astronomer. Has anything odd been happening in the forest? There, there, Jikashi trailed off, still looking at the imp as he remembered something. There, there, there was a fire. A what? Oh, it must have been very big. 
The astronomer stuttered as he spoke. There was smoke everywhere. High above the trees, the fire didn't reach my observatory, but the hole outside smelled like burning. A fire, the imp said, running away from Shikashi. But there are still trees standing. It didn't burn the whole forest down, Shikashi said, calming now. He was hopeful he'd met the evil child's demands. The forest fire lasted several hours, though. Who started it? The imp asked, whirling back to the old man. I don't know, Shikashi answered. Oh, think of an answer. Stupid old man, think of an answer. If he didn't, things might start all the way over. Well, whoever it was, they didn't finish the job. The astronomer thought he felt a wicked smile beginning behind the mask. Finished the job? You can't just burn down part of a forest, the Skull Kid said. Someone has to finish it. But why would you? Why wouldn't you? Silence followed, and the old man regarded the cold, orange eyes. The dresser was still ablaze, crackling behind them. <laughs> I thank you, old man. The imp finally said, turning to leave. Shikashi watched him intently, hoping that he wouldn't do anything else. Please, just go. Oh. The Skull Kid, however, did stop, but he did not turn around. Why do you cling so desperately to life? He asked. The imp sounded genuinely curious, but despite the lack of anger, there was a darkness to his question. The astronomer licked his lips again, swallowing. Answer carefully, or he'll kill you. He watched the imp's back as he spoke. So I can do what I love. Sweat trickled along his face as he gambled for his life. He couldn't stop shaking. He tried his best to hide his fear. And through doing that, I can remain true to myself and my passions while I can. The Skull Kid did not respond. He remained facing the door, as if thinking it over. The old man remained where he was, waiting to see what happened next. The imp thrust his arms into the air. The telescope crunched inward on itself to form a flat disk, causing the entire apparatus to crash through the ceiling. Jagged metal rained over the room as the telescope descended into the observatory. Shikashi tried to run from the falling debris, but his weak knees hindered him. His mouth remained open in shock as the metal and glass roared. <gasps> Somehow, he was spared. The ruins of his telescope crashed behind him, breaking through the floor and bringing the platform with it to the bottom level. As the dust cleared, the Skull Kid stood still, watching the door. The floor's new hull was only an inch behind him. The astronomer peered in the chasm. There rested his most prized possession, gone, forever. The sun shone brightly through his absent ceiling. <laughs> no! Shikashi cried. No! He sank to his knees at its edge, his bright blue eyes watering in disbelief. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> You said... Do you still want to live? The imp turned around, floating to the old man's face. Shikashi refused to look up, staring down at his lost passion. <laughs> Please... He said, averting his gaze as he wept. <laughs> You've taken everything else. Don't take my life. <laughs> The 
imp continued to stare, as if challenging him to look up, but the former astronomer did not. Then you lied to me, the Skull Kid said. You humans are cowards. The only reason you want to live is because you are afraid of death. And then he flew from the broken observatory, leaving Shikashi to mourn in the ruin of his life. 